Hello. 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 Got everybody's attention. Uh, a couple of members of our panel will be uh, joining us hopefully very soon. We know one of them's in the hall. Probably got hung up by an entrepreneur uh, wrestling him down for money. Um, is there anybody here not looking for money? Easier to ask the question that way. <laughs> <laughs> all of them. All of them. All of them. This is uh, this is about getting capital into your uh, into your organization. So if that's what uh, you came here for, then hopefully we'll be able to uh, please and provide you a lot of uh, information, uh, some of which you may not already know. The one thing you do know already is that it's hard to get. Um, so we're not going to belabor that point. Uh, Tom and I, Tom McFadden and I, were talking a little while ago. Tom's with the SBA. Uh, I'm also going to assume that none of you are banking. None of you could probably walk into a bank today and get a loan because you're just not quite far enough along with your technology or your, or your company yet. Uh, but there will come a time, uh, that's got to be your goal because actually when it comes to capital, that's probably the cheapest money you're going to be able to find. The money we're going to talk about today, except for Adrian's, but even his, too, uh, can be expensive. And some of it very expensive money. And uh, you don't want it if you don't, you don't want to take it if you don't have to, uh, in some respects. We're also going to explain why, even though it may be expensive money, it's extremely valuable money because of the value add that, it, that comes along with it. So we'll cover that as well. Um, now, the first thing we're going to talk about, though, is the best kind of capital you can raise for your business, and that is sales and getting money from your customer. There is the ultimate capital capture. And so uh, let me start by stealing from my friend Anik uh, a statement he made a couple of years ago at an event we did. Uh, and I love the way he introduced, the way he started off. First of all, everyone get out your cell phones. Make sure that they're on and turn them up. We don't want anybody to lose out on the opportunity to make a sale. <laughs> and it just might be a customer who is going to call you in the next 60 minutes. And just because you're in this room, we wouldn't want you to miss that opportunity. Um, without further ado, well, I probably ought to introduce myself in case there is somebody here that doesn't know me. My name is Skip Sims. I'm with Ann Arbor Spark. Uh, among uh, a handful of responsibilities, I also manage the Michigan Angel Fund and uh, a few of other uh, programs that Spark operates, uh, I kind of oversee our entrepreneurial activity. And I was asked to moderate this particular panel on uh, finding capital. So let me introduce, first of all, Anik Anguli. Anik is with the Game Group. Um, to, I don't know, you're, you're many things. So um, at the risk of leaving one or three of them out, I'll let you introduce what the Game Group does. And, uh, but the number one message you're going to hear from Anik today, and the reason I invited him to be on the panel is to help you. There's my phone. Uh, nope, no money there. So, um, the is to talk about getting the money that means the most to you, and that is from your customers. So, without further ado, let me turn this over and Anik. Hi, everybody. Um, the since 2006, I've been an angel investor in the southeastern Michigan community. My background is in enterprise software. Um, and over the last seven years or so, I've um, made early stage investments in fledgling enterprise software companies and digital marketing companies. Um, breaking news, I was just telling Adrian and, and Skip, as of the beginning of this year, I'm not taking any more portfolio companies and, and I'm focusing on one of my portfolio companies that has grown to 10 million in sales, self-funded, bootstrapped on the basis of its customers' money, no outside investment. And uh, we're, we're now going to focus on taking it from 10 to 20 million dollars in sales over the next couple of years. Um, so the message that I have been carrying over the, the last little while and will continue to do is focusing very early and engaging with your customers it, it's almost accepted religion now with customer discovery and all of the entire school of thought, uh, starting with Steve Blank. Um, 
but I'd like to take that a step further, more appropriate companies. And that step further is to minimize the amount of dilutive capital you raise by getting money from customers as early as possible, and certainly before you have a product, a product ready. So, um, how do you do that? Okay, so it, it depends on, on the kind of company you are, but if you are, if you are a fledgling enterprise software company in particular, then there are very many forms of it. Digital marketing is part of enterprise software. I, I actually have gradually, through trial and error, come to a, a very systematic five-step process for building up an enterprise software company. Um, and it actually starts with services. You, you, you focus on solving a problem, first and foremost, that is a very painful, very important, expensive problem for your customers. Uh, and <clears throat> based on your understanding of that problem, you're building the business. So, so the first money you get, essentially, is a consulting engagement. And the deliverable of that engagement is some sort of a solution that includes software. The tricky thing to do is to make sure you retain your IP. And in, as you go from this first step of inception, to market discovery, to testing the repeatability of your solution, you are growing the amount of intellectual capital that you own. But you're doing it by delivering solutions to your earliest customers and getting cash in return. So at the very least, what it does, it, this process does, is it reduces the amount of dilutive capital you have to raise. It's not an either or proposition in my mind. It simply reduces the amount of dilutive capital you have to raise. And by paying attention to your IP and being confident uh, about the value you bring to the table in solving a really expensive problem, I have repeatedly shown that, that you can, in fact, get customers to fund a significant portion of their growth. Now, you, you keep talking about IT. Does it apply in other industries? It, it can. The, the, the fundamental preconditions are, number one, that the problem is very big. Okay. I, have, I have no experience with consumer software that, uh, well, or consumer products, other than the fact that Skip talked me into spending $500 on something I'd only seen a picture of recently. <laughs> I was the victim, <coughs> the participant, <laughs> eager participant in the Kickstarter campaign for the, the goggle thing. Mm -hmm. and, Glyph. Huh? Glyph. Glyph. Let's get it right. I'm going to get a million. Glyph, yes. Go to Kickstarter and look at that Glyph thing. And you might find that picture as valuable as 500 bucks and I promise it will be by pictures. <laughs> so, but my, my basic um, experience is, is not in consumer products. So the problem has to be big enough. And to me, big enough is when you are really rolling, the value of each customer is multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars to you. So think of problems that are million dollar problems for each one of your customers. So that's one precondition. The second precondition is in whatever you are doing, IP can build gradually. It's not like a pharmaceutical compound where you have to build up all of the IP, secure all of it, get all of your clearance, get through regulatory hurdles, and then and only then can you make your first stop. It doesn't apply in that world. So IP can build gradually. Um, and number three, um, I think this is a precondition, although I've seen some younger people pull this off. You've got to have a little bit of gray hair. And it is it is much easier for me to walk into a Fortune 500 company and emerge with a solution order of tens if not hundreds of thousands of dollars than it is for a 21 year old. So th those, those are sort of the markers that I look for. Okay, so the, the takeaways are, one, you need to have a product or service that solves a major pain point. If it's not a major pain point, then it becomes a nice to have, not a must have. But if it's a must have, you've got the customer over the barrel a bit. 
uh, provided you can deliver it. Uh, and then the other big takeaway is uh, rarely is anybody going to be able to do this on their own. Uh, a, a company to be a company and to sell requires a team, and that usually goes beyond just the engineering team and the, the mad scientists, but it also includes a biz dev guy, it includes an operating <coughs> guy, a management kind of person involved as a team, so that there's some depth there that the company can rely on and trust that they can, in fact, deliver uh, once they make the commitment. Yeah. And if they're coming out of the industry that you're selling to, you have instant credibility and you've been there, you've owned the problem. Yeah, if you're coming out of the industry, the other thing is you've got probably your own Rolodex and you have relationships you can build on from the past. Yeah. So it's not a cold call either, necessarily. Right. Okay. All right, so um, once you have the first sale uh, and you have a little bit of cash coming in, uh, now you have also made your life a whole lot easier relative to being able to raise private capital um, if, in fact, you do still need to do that. If you can't bootstrap 100% and now you need to raise some money, uh, having some revenue uh, to talk about helps you a ton. If you are pre-revenue, then the value of your company just went down a lot, and the investor is going to want a whole lot more equity, which makes it even more painful. So uh, again, getting that first customer before you go raise money is extremely valuable. So our angel is not in the room yet. He's still in the hall. Somebody's still <laughs> twisting his arm. So let me uh, jump forward to Adrian. Adrian represents a, uh, a couple of sources of capital. Uh, one, he works for Invest Detroit, and they have, in part, an economic development mandate. However, having said that, and having been uh, in the initial stages of, of the first step fund, on their administrative committee, I also know that the one reason that Invest Detroit was selected uh, to manage that was because although they're not investors, they do expect to get paid back. It's not a pure economic development activity. Um, but it is focused, and so Adrian can speak to a couple of things. One, what's the investor looking for? Uh, because they do wear that hat first. And then um, what are the economic, what are the benefits of going to an economic development organization uh, for, for funding? Well, hi, uh, maybe you give a bit, a bit of background as well. Uh, uh, I, mean, uh, I um, uh, spent about uh, eight years doing automotive engineering work at a, a company here locally. Uh, uh, now my phone's ringing. Um, and uh, then decided I didn't want to be in, in the, uh, automotive corporate life anymore and, and jumped into a startup where it was headquartered in, in Skip's office uh, at Spark and then uh, from there have uh, started the three other software companies and I think all told raised about 25 million in venture capital here in the Bay Area uh, and then about a year and a half ago decided to come back uh, to this year kind of stay here and has since then been running uh, the first step fund with some partners, and then more recently we've launched a new venture capital uh, fund called Detroit Innovate. Um, back on that, so. so <clears throat> there's probably some, there may be some people in the room. Uh, anyone receive funding from the first step fund? Um, oh, no. Okay. Look at all these potential customers. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you describe that fund for everybody? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a very unique fund, and, and um, it can it can use a number of different instruments to invest. We have a few straight conventional loans um, uh, at, a, at a healthy interest rate, um, and we also have lots and lots of convertible notes which are notes that we, some we expect to convert, and some we think probably won't convert, and maybe they'll just get, you know, they, the hope is they'll just get paid back. And then we have quite a few straight equity investments um, into, into a uh, into company. So there's been 56 investments so far, or 56 companies, I should say, so far in the three and a half years that it's been active. Um, and it's an industry agnostic fund. 
we are just looking for something that has some scale potential. Um, uh, tends to be around $50,000, sometimes less, sometimes closer to $25,000 uh, in the company. And we also tend to be the first institutional money into a company. Not always, but generally speaking, that's the, the, what we like to, uh, to sit. And that often manifests it in, a, in that we are sort of the first fifty to $100,000 commitment on a round that's anywhere from two hundred and fifty to five hundred thousand um, dollars, and then in, in some unique circumstances, we'll do um, you know more conventional loans uh, for special circumstances. And our focus is Southeast Michigan, um, and uh, we have interest in inclusion. We have interest in uh, minority-owned companies, uh, immigrant-owned companies, women-owned companies uh, as well. Uh, we have about uh, a million and a half left in the fund. <laughs> So I'd like to explore between the two of us, um, there's a lot of microloan programs around the state. It's not unique to, to Southeast Michigan. Um, they all have their little nuances, but they all have one core thing in common, and that is they're about really about economic development for the local community. Um, can you expand a little bit about how the First Step Fund came about and what the economic development reason behind it is? Absolutely. So it was a, it was started out as a $5 million fund in 2010. Uh, and it was funded exclusively by a group called the New Economy Initiative. And it's a group of 10 foundations that put together money for, to, to the initial one was $100 million. The idea of that $100 million was to jumpstart, uh, in remember, 2009, not so great, 2010, not so great, um, uh, we did to jumpstart uh, a diversified economy with exclusive focus on entrepreneurship in South Asia, uh, and specifically in Detroit. And so uh, when all these folks got together, Skip, uh, the investor group, well before I came along, um, the idea was here's some first sort of initial money just to get some startups moving. Uh, just to get some velocity going in, uh, in, that, uh, in that frame. So um, that was the angle. Now, one, one sort of, Skip mentioned nuance. Nuance difference is that we are, are uh, targeting an evergreen fund. That is a very difficult, if not impossible, thing to do if you, if you know the, <laughs> the way things work at a $5 million number. Most people would say you can't do an evergreen fund with less than $20 million. But the, the goal is still that we are uh, in, you know, striving for every So that means that um, these are not grants. Um, these are not loans that we're just going to let languish. Uh, we are uh, going uh, to the, the company. We're going to adhere to the to the contract and to and, and, and to make sure that that, that money uh, is not lost. And so um, this is not a gift. <laughs> this is an investment. Thank you for uh, underlining that. I know in Ann Arbor there's a microloan program through Spark. Um, in fact, we manage a couple of them. Um, and then there's also some even smaller loan funds. Adrian mentioned up to $50,000. That's what ours is too. But there are other microloan programs for companies that are not tech-based, that don't need quite that amount of money. Uh, so search around if you only need Five thousand, ten thousand dollars. There are other. Uh, there are many other uh, programs around, but they all have this in common. They do expect you to pay it back. This is not uh, a, a gift. If it was a gift, we would have given it to you as a grant to begin with. Uh, so the expectation. Now the terms are slightly better in many respects than you might have for a bank, but uh, on the other hand, they may be. Uh, tougher, such as the interest rates usually quite a bit higher. Um, so, but don't take that money expecting that it, it's a freebie and you don't have to pay it back. That is the expectation. You've got a moral obligation. Uh, but it is high risk money and it may be the only money you're going to be able to, to latch on to. There are other programs um, around that uh, the state has that uh, you need to make yourself aware of, go to the MEDC website, you can go to their uh, capital section on their website, and there's a lot of programs to make yourself aware of if you haven't done that already. Uh, Anik, 
can you can speak from uh, the aspect of, a, of an entrepreneur that has taken advantage of some of these. I know you've consulted with some companies that have received some pre-seed uh, capital money as well as some loans, uh, some of these micro loans. Uh, what's been your experience and uh, what's the entrepreneur's, what's your take on that? I, mean, I, I think these are fantastic programs that, that are available to, in our area for a couple of reasons. I mean, once if you're starting a company and it's a first-time founder, um, once you get through the, the usual rounds of training and go through the Ann Arbor Spark Boot Camp or other, as I say, equivalents <coughs> around the state, <laughs> um, but you, you've got through some of that training, you know how to put together your uh, pitch, you, you're in front of some friendly crowds, and this might be the first place where you're successful in raising some money. And the boost in confidence that a first-time founder gets by getting a yes from a real money source um, is absolutely tremendous. So there's a huge psychological benefit, first and foremost. Se secondly, having gone through that screen, is, is, it puts you in a different rank from the, the rest of the people with, you know, two people in a PowerPoint. Um, so it, it's a credibility jump for you to, to apply, get through that process, and secure funding from some of these uh, microloans. And the, the terms uh, of these microloans are very, very entrepreneur friendly. Um, they, I mean, no, no bank will give you terms like this. And, uh, the, the managers who run these funds understand the, the situation that first-time founders are in uh, and have structured the decision-making process appropriately and stru structured the legal terms around the fund appropriately. And I'll give you examples of both. Um, in terms of the process, one of the things that I found very frustrating as I was helping some of my portfolio companies really get started was how long it took people to make a decision. They, they said they were interested, they would ask for some information, you'd go and present to them, they'd say, we're going to think it over, we're talking amongst ourselves. Weeks go by, you don't hear from them. Then they, 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 the, the, the ones that make you excited and make you waste even more time say, come back and present some more to us and give us another update, etc. So the protected um, decision cycle wastes a lot of time. It gives you sometimes very false hope waste your time and energy. Whereas there's, in, in, in the microloan program that Spark manages, the decision-making process is clearly laid out in time bound. I mean, I, I don't know if you guys know what a benefit that is for entrepreneurs, but I, I found that to be a tremendous benefit, first and foremost. Second, in terms of the, the legal term, it is subordinate to everything else that you already may have raised and it's subordinate to other debt that you may raise in the future. I mean, if you haven't gone through the process of raising chunks of money at a time, you won't appreciate the value of this automatic subordination. So that, that's an example of how these funds are really, really entrepreneur friendly. Uh, Adrian, also talk about the fact that, you, you mentioned the fact that you're, you're often the first institutional money uh, one, you might want to talk about why you use that word, mm -hmm. institutional. But I think to underscore what Onik just said, um, despite the fact that these are economic development organizations that run these programs for the most part, and they've got a mandate to you know, nurture and develop the culture of a particular community uh, and grow it, it's not free money. It, you, know, you don't just walk in the door and say, we've had this happen, uh, I, I want $5,000. Uh, explain the process, explain yeah. what they have to do. This is, you know, we take it very seriously, and you're going to have to work for it and yeah. earn it. Yeah. So I'll take the first one first. So the, the, we, we use the term institutional because we, we are an institution. So we have a, a family of funds in a, in a neighborhood of $130 million worth of funds that are managed in over all the different Best Detroit uh, funds. There's like eight of them. Uh, between uh, mes debt to real estate to the real estate funds that we do. Um, with that comes a lot of um, discipline, 
uh, both internally and externally. Uh, so um, we will uh, you know, require you know, financial reporting from our company. We will at times require uh, board seats and those board observer seats for some companies. Um, we'll also, I think maybe, the, maybe one of the more um, helpful things is we will go into a round and we will uh, clean up terms. Many times entrepreneurs, uh, especially when they're first time, they'll agree to terms that seem like they're reasonable but are not actually reasonable. And they don't know because they don't have the experience to do that. So we'll come in and look at a company and say, okay, this is pretty interesting to us, but we're not going to sign that term sheet. We're, we don't believe that is an appropriate, um, appropriate term sheet. Um, and one that will just be ripe with, uh, uh, with issues uh, towards the end of, of that note because it has a, a very low conversion uh, rate, um, uh, uh, high dilution factor at the end of the note, and things like that that we know will cause problems and are, are not market. You know, we see so many deals in so many companies that we believe that we know what market is for different stages of the company. Um, we don't see market for some reason, um, then we say, you know, here are some other terms. And oftentimes, that's usually a successful event because you know what? You know what happened? The angel that set those terms also is in very experience, right? And they say, oh, okay, well, I didn't realize those were, oh, I can see what that is. And it's a very sort of positive uh, discussion for everybody involved. Um, so we try to fill that role at times as well. That, that happens more. Well, that segues, uh, given our time here, I'm giving up on Stu and Deal. Great. Uh, I'm going to turn that over then to you to tell them, first of all, there you go. Okay, great. Thanks. They like to count on you guys. Um, from the angel perspective, good. <laughs> um, first of all, I think it's important for people to understand what an angel is. Uh, I think there's a lot of misperception. And then uh, the different, there, are, there are different types of angels. And then, last but not least, and probably most important, what are angels looking for? Um, the difference between an angel and a VC is, as an angel, I'm investing my own money, not somebody else's money. A, a VC firm, a venture capitalist, is typically a manager who has raised money and created a fund, and you're going to talk more, more about that. Um, in the case of Angel, it's none of that. It's, I'm risking my personal money um, on your idea, on your dream. So that, that's what an Angel is. And Angels typically get involved much earlier than VCs will. Um, not, not just typically, almost by definition. You, you don't go to Angels after you've raised VC money. You go to Angels before you've raised VC money. So I'll, I'll talk about sort of how I look at um, opportunities that come to me, people who come to me from, from my own perspective, right? This is not talking about the angel community at large. Skip, maybe you can fill in some of those because Skip runs a uh, angel um, group that I am part of, and um, so he can speak more broadly to collections of angels, if you will. But I'll give you my perspective. You know, the, the people that I value the most who approach me, first of all, have done some homework. I have a certain background, and I'm investing my money to stay involved in business in areas where I have some experience, where I have some connections, and where I might have some operational value to, to a portfolio company. So if you, if you come to me and pitch a consumer product idea, it tells me that you've done no research on my background and my interests. Automatic negative. Um, so just like uh, Skip said, go to the MEDC site and learn what the various sources of funding are available. It is entirely possible for you, not through necessarily just websites, but through people you know by asking around, by doing your own homework and your due diligence to find out what kinds of investments an angel investor has made, what their interests are, what their background is, what their, um, uh, what their cultural propensity is. So 
do, do homework before you approach an angel. So I look for that. The second thing that I almost invariably look for is um, at least pairs, if not a bigger team. So if you have a great idea and you haven't convinced another human being to join you in the venture to, to start this business and grow it before you start raising money, that's an automatic red flag for me. Um, so I, I look for people who have recognized that company building is a team sport, that no one person can be smart enough or have enough hours in the day to successfully build a high growth potential business. So you, you've started to think about and you've got commitments to your team. So when you come to see me as an angel, you're coming as a team, um, and the team is a strong team. The, the third thing that I, I really look for is what I would call personality or cultural fit. Um, you know, you take any two random people, they may or may not get along. Right? And when you're approaching an angel, you should be looking for that cultural fit uh, as well. Because you're going to be talking to your angel investor a lot, working with them a lot. And if you don't like the way they think, if you don't like their values, if you don't like the way they see the world, it is going to be hell for you. And it's going to be very frustrating for the angel investor. So that is one of the things that I look for right up front. You know, it's, it's an inexact thing, but that rapport and bond has to build um, very quickly for me to be interested in investing in, in somebody's idea. Um, going beyond that, the, the fourth thing that I look for is the economics of the deal. And one of the most important things to me is what kind of money will be necessary? Uh, what kind of dilutive money will be necessary for this company to grow after I sign up? If they're going to need, if a company is going to need a lot of VC investment, it's not a good place for me to be. I, I think I can generalize this to most angels, but I'm not sure. But as a matter of personal preference, I have been burnt by VCs coming in later after me, and I dislike deals where a company is going to require serious VC scale money uh, as a condition of its growth back. Um, that makes me feel like I'm gonna get crushed out of the equation um, and never see a payday. So ventures that are very, very capital and, uh, efficient and can grow with very small amounts of angel scale money. I'm speaking to you, Stu. Are, are attractive to me for that reason. Um, and, and finally, it, it's really helpful to hear from a company or a team that is pitching me that they empathize with the level of risk that an angel investor is taking. Right? It is, I mean, nobody's giving away money for free. I'm in this for a business. Um, uh, and being Getting in at such an early stage is a very risky venture. You know you are taking a big risk. And I find that some of the first-time founders don't even acknowledge that I'm taking a risk when they're approaching me. That's a big turn off for me. So. And the only difference between what Anik was saying in terms of how he looks at it as an individual, and Stu's going to uh, probably confirm this as well, and, and a group of angels, is that uh, with a group, they've probably got the same general attitude, but once one of them either gets positive or gets negative, the rest follow. Um, so you've got to win over at least one and get a real champion on your side in a group setting. But otherwise, a lot of the other criteria is uh, that Anik was just articulating is the same. And uh, there is a real uh, mix among uh, angels who uh, don't mind doing deals with VCs and angels who will absolutely avoid doing a deal with a VC. That is very real. It's not unique among entrepreneurs. It also is, you know, that attitude kind of exists sometimes with individual investors as well. So, uh, Stu, welcome.
<laughs> Why don't you, let me, let me do one thing, just so you can kind of get a flavor of, of the conversation and you kind of get your thoughts. I'm going to jump to Adrian, and I'm going to put the burden on Adrian to defend the venture capitalists <laughs> and tell you why VCs are not all that bad. Because <laughs> most of us used to be entrepreneurs now. Um, no, I, I, you know, I, think, I think there's a, there are different kinds of venture capitalists, right? Um, and that would be one thing that I kind of start off the conversation, you know. Uh, Especially a lot of us locally, we you know we certainly are, are operating venture capital firms. We have you know uh, a number of in, investors, but because of the size of our funds, they they tend to be more kind of larger angel funds. So you're talking about funds that are maybe 12 million dollars, maybe up to 15 million dollars, and those tend to be seed stage uh, funds. And, and why those and why we uh, are uh, valuable it is because um, for the companies that do need to go down that path that Anik was talking about, larger scale companies are going to need 10 to 20 million dollars or more, uh, 50 million dollars, you're going to need an entry point to that conversation. And oftentimes that entry point is a few different pathways. It's, it's simply network, which, which we have. Uh, it's also strategic in positioning the company to a point of being an, an appetizing for a Series A investor that would want to put in five to ten million dollars, right? And that's a different, um, a different conversation, a, actually a different strategy than you would have if you just wanted to go with fairly modest angel funding of a few hundred thousand dollars up to maybe a million dollars, uh, and looking to sort of break even after that amount of money. You know, oftentimes we're not interested in breaking even for a, quite a long time. Right, because we're looking to get maximum rent market penetration, uh, which requires a lot of money. Um, there's a lot of other things, but those are the key things that are top of that. And, and I'll also say that um, from my experience, and I've worked with venture capitalists for more than 10 years, they're sincere when they do approach you in the hall and they say, you know, I like that idea, I like that technology, I want to stay in touch. Um, they are sincere when they say that. They do want to keep in touch and they want to keep track of your growth. Just don't be naive. If they, they take their time. You know, it'll take months for them to really get acquainted, get to know your technology. They want to see you achieve a few milestones um, but uh, and allow for, for that time. They're not going to invest next month. But as long as you know that going in, uh, they're terrific people and they're full of knowledge. They're very smart. And you can certainly uh, benefit from their mentoring. And a lot of them will mentor you, whether they put another, whether they put a penny in your company or not. There are a lot of VCs in, in the state of Michigan who will mentor you, uh, which is invaluable, and is free. Uh, so okay. And, and uh, the finance, um, he's he's a good, he's a he's a good guy. I uh, put another hat on uh, uh, just recently where I've been working out, uh, helping a, a company uh, raise some money. We've been working very closely with Adrian. Uh, and it, it, the, the First Step Fund uh, is like the name implies, uh, you know, they, they deal with, with early stage companies. Most venture groups won't do that. And, uh, you know, I, I think that's, uh, I like it. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> good guy. He's not, not one of the bad guys. And, and Stu's one of the good angels. Uh, he's very independent. Good which is the other reason I asked him to come and share with you his philosophy. Uh, he is sometimes a seed investor. It's important to understand the stage your business is in. Most angels will not do seed investing. That, and you can describe that to what, what a seed investor is. Uh, most angels will want you a little bit further along, but Stu's not against investing you when you're further along also. Uh, but very independent. So, Stu, tell yeah. us your story well, and what you're looking for. Yeah, and what I look, look for is, uh, you know, sort of uh, good ideas. I, obviously, I like, you know, when uh, when I see it, I know what it is, you know, sort of like pornography. Uh, <laughs> I, but, you know, to me, probably the most important thing is, is the team itself. I, I really uh, put a, a, an inordinate amount of weight on the, on the, on the team. Uh, because I know I've, I've been involved in enough startups to see that, uh, 
you know, you, the word pivot, you know, is a perfect word for it that uh, came out, I forget where it came from. Uh, but uh, I've seen so many pivots out there where, where, where you have to change your mind and suddenly you're, you're going after some market that you didn't think that you're going after and your go-to market, you know, sort of goes by the wayside. So I think it's that management team that's the critical critical piece for me. So I like to, and uh, you know, you know, put my money with the, with the uh, with the entrepreneurs uh, and make sure that they work well together as a team. And then Skip's right. I do I do like to go where because I don't I don't put large sums of money in any of these businesses. And I typically close start with a twenty five thousand dollar investment. And then uh, after I get to knowing very well that uh, down the road I'm going to have to put some more in in order to keep keep uh, you know my, my my position. So uh, that's why I start out with a small number, and you know I'd like to have you know ten of these investments going you know sort of at any one time because you really they are very risky, uh, especially at this stage, you know, and uh, you know fully anticipating that. You know, six of these are going to go out of business, and, and uh, two of them are going to become walking wounded or zombies, and then two of them are going to give you all your money back. And sometimes maybe even only one, uh, but that's that's why you have to sort of diversify, diversify on these also. But I do like to be early because I think that um, it the the teams uh, uh, obviously appreciate it because getting that first investor is really hard, uh, and people just. I mean, Aiden, he'll tell you this, I'm going right through it with him. Uh, right now, it's, uh, it's just, uh, it's very difficult. Uh, and everybody wants to be the, the last investor and instead of the first. And so I like to try and facilitate that if I can. So Stu just said that six out of 10 of you in this room are gonna fail. Um, one of the things we're changing in our culture in the state of Michigan is we're celebrating failure. Uh, Failure is not necessarily a bad thing as long as you learn from it. And then go do it again. Only don't make the same mistake twice and do it better the second time and be hugely successful the second time. Just because the guy failed the first time, does that keep him from getting funding? Oh, no. Uh -uh. In fact, sometimes, you know, those are merit badges that, uh, you know, they've been through it and, and if they've learned from it, uh, I mean, I think that that's key. And then the other thing is failing quickly. You know, before you get you drag two million dollars down, it's nice to you know, especially if it's a lot of your own hard earned cash. Uh, it, uh, failing quickly is um, preferable to failing later. Uh, yeah, <laughs> later, many dollars later. Later dollars. Many dollars later. Um, all right, we've got ten minutes left, so uh, <coughs> so that we be so we'll answer the questions you came here to get answered in case we haven't already done so. It's open mic time, so if anybody has a question or comment, uh, please don't be shy. Come on up. If I don't think entrepreneurs fail, politics fail, but entrepreneurs will fail. Uh, my name is Pavit. I'm with the Southeast Michigan Sustainability Business Forum. And uh, my concern is that are we all looking for the market stake for many of these companies? And if you go into sustainability critical areas, renewable energy and health and dietetics and water and food. And these are very different kind of companies which have had long gestation periods and will, will require, I think, a very different kind of a commitment. I'm just wondering if any of you had any comments about how do we go and take care of these? One, one of the things that I um, explain to companies that approach me um, is Angel, my money is more patient money. I am not working to somebody else's predefined time frame. I don't have to finish working on a fund in 10 years. Um, so I, I can be as patient as I choose to be as long as there is growth. And there are many ways for my investment to pay off for me. Um, getting as a stream of cash, um, every year, a little bit of cash, a little growing bit of cash every year is fine. I don't have to have a portfolio company exit to feel happy about the portfolio company. So, um, you know, in contrast with VCs, the profile of companies that uh, would be, um, that I'd be happy with are different and would include companies like the ones you described. The other thing I'd extend to that is, um 
are other funds uh, out there that have interests in sort of sustainability and or social interests. Uh, so the two that come to mind are one's Mission Throttle, um, which is a, a group, sort of a double bottom line uh, investment group out of Southfield. And the other one is the Social um, the social Venture Fund, I believe it is, out of uh, University of Michigan Ross School of Business. Um, both of those have sort of double bottom line in, um, investment uh, focuses. Here in Rivers. Sort of there. there yeah. They started out that way. Maybe yeah, they, I mean, they, 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 but they're more on the, you know, conventional sort of VC decisions like Anik is talking about. Um, I just had a question. If you aren't sure that you are, would require venture capital or an angel investor, what's the best way to go about it? I currently have a company and it's bringing in money from customers. So right now, we don't need investors, but to grow at the rate that we would like to, it, it definitely would be a much bigger help and a faster process. So what's your recommendation there? Well, it's it sounds to me like if there's uh, if there's significant growth potential, that's that's exactly what uh, venture groups are looking for. So what I would do is to, to go find a venture group. I mean, I'm not sure what business you're in, but uh, they definitely have specializations where they specialize in different areas, and it really offends them if you come up and you approach somebody that sort of, you know, wants to, looking for IT things and you're, you know, something else. Uh, so you need to do your homework and, and find the ones that would be relevant, and then just start conversations with them. You know, just have them get on their radar screen so that they can see you and get used to it. Because the whole process, I mean, a minimum is four months. You know, to I mean, I, and even four months is fast. I mean, yeah. You know, the thing I say to that is that you figure out what kind of money you want. Do you want dilutive money? Do you want non-dilutive money? Right. If you have a reasonable enough revenue uh, stream and you've had it for a couple of years, you may be able to look at some some debt uh, money, right? Um, uh, or if you want, you know, dilutive sort of equity, um, that you know, that's another way to go. But the, the best thing is to go and find an unbiased person. Um, knowledgeable, unbiased person, and, and there's a lot of those people uh, at some of the smart zones. Skip is at Spark, Tech Town, um, groups, you know, those sorts of uh, areas where you can you can go and, and talk to some mentors there that 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 should give you unbiased advice. Um, you may not have the proper expertise to answer this, but um, I'd just like to get your opinion on like federal and state crowdfunding acts and how that's going to impact impact um, financing for startup companies and how that's going to impact your decisions to also throw money in. Like you said, you don't like to get involved if, they're, if you're an angel and they're looking for VCs. Well, if they've got funding from other from crowdfunding sources, is that going to impact your decision as well? We have an expert in the room. <laughs> you're okay. okay. Uh, my name is Chris Miller, and I've been attached to the Michigan crowdfunding effort um, for about the last couple of years, uh, in particular the last six months or so. Uh, so the short answer to that question is there's really no way to answer it. Um, you know, this is a brand new vehicle. Uh, personally, I think it's an incredible vehicle. I think it's a game-changing vehicle. Skip probably feels a little bit different than I do on that, but maybe not. I don't know. Um, but uh, there, there's some central things that you should know about the Michigan crowdfunding bill. First of all, it's the best one out there. Five states right now have done crowdfunding. Two of them legislatively, including Michigan, and exactly 30 days ago, the governor signed the bill and made it law in Michigan. So uh, startup businesses or businesses that are, that are new don't have uh, audited financials can raise up to a million dollars from non-accredited investors. That, Line is about 97% of the population right now is are non-accredited investors, unable to invest directly. Um, businesses that have been around for a while and have audited financials can raise up to two million dollars from those same non-accredited ventures. It's a really easy deal. It's a one-page application on the LARA website at the state. It costs 100 bucks. What you want to do is the same thing that these guys have been talking to you about the whole time, and that is get smart people who can help you with it. And obviously, because crowdfunding is pretty new. That's going to be a little bit challenging, but the, the business principles are the same regardless of what it is. Um, coming up in March at the Michigan Municipal League's uh, Capital Conference, there's going to be a crowdfunding panel that will be quite good. Uh, it looks pretty interesting. Ben Miller from Fundrise in Washington, D.C. has done a lot of great uh, crowdfunding uh, work right now. Um, 
in real estate is going to be there. Amy Cortez, who are what called local vesting, to talk about vesting in your own communities is going to be there. A uh, gentleman out of Indianapolis called uh, Kevin Hitchin, he runs a website called Local State, which Skip is very familiar with, uh, where you can do your whole investment. Investors can come right on the website and do it. It's going to be there. We're going to have an entrepreneur who's, we think, going to be the first crowdfunding project in the state uh, that will be on the panel. And even a conventional banker is going to be on that panel. Rick DeBreeze, the chief uh, executive officer of Monarch Bank. So, I've also got some cards. Uh, I would be happy to uh, connect you with those that I think are pretty smart on this, uh, as I think with anybody else up here. Uh, stop by and see me. I've got a big button. The only other thing that I would uh, extend to that um, from the, the venture side, at least, um, it's unclear how uh, the, the greater community will react from a, a large equity uh, position for crowdfunding. However, uh, very favorable if you do a non-equity piece, so it's effectively working capital. So we've got a, a common investment we do with Skip and Avagat, we just mentioned that earlier. Well, they're on, their, on a path to, to do almost a million dollars in, in, um, in pre-product sales. And that is going to result in, in wonderful things, we think, uh, from a, an investment perspective. So that's an, an important difference. And, 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 and tangential that important, and that is in Michigan's crowdfunding law, it, it doesn't have to be an equity position. So the investors can take an equity position, they can take a debt position, they can even take a revenue sharing position. So there's latitude. So if you've got, if you have a, a company that's going to be able to scale up and you're going to need to visit with angels or VCs, you can protect those, that future opportunity by bringing in those initial investors from the community if it makes sense, or from the field if it makes sense. Uh, in a debt position and not damage the future opportunity to, to grow with VCs or patients. You know, from my standpoint, the question, I guess, was would, would I participate in it? And the, and the, question, the answer is absolutely not. Uh, I just think that, that, that there's too many investors in it and too many small investors. To me, uh, unaccredited, you know, translates to stupid. And the stupid people are the ones that sue you. So that's why I wouldn't do it now. On, 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 if it's somebody that wants to, that's doing a product, and I'm working with somebody that's doing a product also, uh, I think it's a great idea. You're just getting working capital and whatever you know margin you have goes right directly to whatever you want to do for your growth. And the other issue, the other way also is, and I know is that there's ways where where uh, you know an angel group could could. Uh, could vet a, a, a you know a, a project or a company, and then the, the angel group would sort of syndicate it. So if you put together you know 50 crowdfunding investors and they came up with one name that was going to go on the on the cap table, you know ABC LLC, you know that would be fine. I mean because now you've got just one one vote out there that's doing it, but dealing with a myriad of, of uh, individual investors to me would be a nightmare. It would be a, a, a no go. Um, I'll make a couple of comments. First of all, I totally agree with Chris. This is a game changer. Life is going to be different for you in raising money. No question. What we don't know is, and we won't know for a couple more years, was it a good game changer or not. Um, and people have opinions, as you can tell. I apologize to Chris, because the other thing I think you're going to find coming to these conferences in the future, on this kind of panel, there'll be another chair for a crowdfunding representative to explain what's going on uh, and to educate. And you're also already starting to see actual events, programs, uh, presentations that are 100% just about crowdfunding. So, uh, you know, I'd encourage you to educate yourself about that and take advantage of those opportunities uh, to learn more about it. Uh, we are about out of time, but we do have one more question tonight. So that young lady back there, you had your hand up. What, uh, what do you think about foreign money? I foreign was, money. I was on a conference with the U.S. Chamber um, <coughs> yesterday, and the Department of Commerce is seeking loads of outside money from foreign investors to come in and work with uh, small to medium enterprises to level the playing field, especially if your company is going to be global in products. So your question is, uh, how do we feel about foreign investors in general? Does it impact our attitude? Should it impact your, should you be concerned? Should you be eager to take it? 
that's a great topic. Uh, it's, we could put another panel together just on that topic. <laughs> the Chinese want to invest in this country like crazy, uh, but they're not alone. I mean, there are people from all over the globe that would love to invest in this country. How you do that, uh, I'm not sure anybody on this panel can really answer your question. It's complicated. It is very complicated, right. which is one reason probably we all avoid it. Right, but I think it's something because our government now is pushing it because they recognize that there's not enough of seed investment to get behind the entrepreneurs that are coming in with large scale-ups to get started. Yeah, the government is eager and anxious to for you to take that foreign investment. Um, I take it from America first, if you can get it. Uh, with that, thank you for uh, coming. And well, I want to just congratulate all of you. You're the entrepreneurs. You're the ones that's making it happen. You're the ones that are making me proud to be a Michigander. Have a great rest of the day.